long before the multiplexes and long before IMAX screens and YouTube streams, man was already moved by motion. Magic lantern slides brought the world to life in pictures. The first lantern slides were created in the 1600s, around 200 years before photography was invented. They provided spectacular entertainment and education in the way that cinema does today. The first slides were made by painting images onto small pieces of glass. People viewed the painted slides by shining candle or gaslight through them. The first idea about projected images comes to the West, I suppose, in the 17th century. But quite soon after that, you have ideas like the camera obscura. You still get them today in many cities. You also get the magic lantern uh, coming through at the end of the 17th century. And it remains probably the most popular form of movie image entertainment up to um, the advent of cinema. The invention of electricity meant light bulbs could be used instead. Electric light projectors created sharper, brighter and bigger images, which meant larger audiences could view lantern slideshows together. A magic lantern is basically a simple slide projector that uh, uses uh, images painted on glass or photographs on glass but most people might think that's a kind of be all and end all of it that it just produces still images and that's not the case at all because many of the images actually have moving parts some of them have uh, levers sliding pieces of glass and also if you bank up your lanterns you have two or three lanterns working in tandem then it's possible to produce transformations dissolves all kinds of wonderful tricks and that in a way is why it's called a magic lantern and it retained that name right up until the beginning of cinema and beyond here he is ladies and gentlemen bonzo the wonder dog now, Bonzo will perform a wonderful trick for you. He is going to leap into the air straight through the hoop at the word of command. And the word of command is hoopla. Here we go. Keep your eye on the dog. How one, two, three, hoopla. And now that's very difficult to do. Years of practice. Now, you may be wondering who invented this wonderful device, the magic lantern. Well, we don't know. What we do know is that it was used by conjuring priests like this chap you see here to literally put the fear of God into people in ancient times. Who would have thought that a horse and a bet could make such an impact on the development of motion pictures? And it all started when Leland Stanford the former governor of California made a wager with some friends that all four hoofs of his galloping horse were off the ground at the same time. So he commissioned British photographer Edward Moybridge to help solve the puzzle. Work commenced on Stanford's Palo Alto Ranch. A camera shed was constructed that enabled Moybridge to line up 24 cameras in a row. Stanford enlisted the help of his engineers from the Central Pacific Railroad to help devise the first electronic shutter. A wire was strung across the track, and the running horse tripped each one, triggering the shutter. On June 15, 1878, the experiment was put in motion. And the result, called the horse in motion, proved conclusively that indeed all four hoofs were off the ground. 
Moybridge took his photographs and printed them on a disc and viewed them on a machine he invented called the Zopraxiscope. He'd go on to do extensive photographic documentation of the attitude of motion in animals and humans. What went around came around to the attention of Thomas Edison. And this kind of spurred Edison to think about, well, maybe there's a way to combine my phonograph with this old prasiscope and we can have talking pictures, opera, things like that. Because of his work, the creation of motion pictures owes a great debt to Edward Muybridge. And you can bet on that. October of 1888, Edison begins to think more about this particular problem and comes up with um, what he thinks is going to be the solution. The, he writes out a patent caveat, this sort of preliminary patent idea, in which he says he's going to do for the eye what the phonograph does for the ear. And he literally is thinking about the phonograph. He has a big cylinder, like his cylinder phonographs, but bigger, and he's going to put little micro photographs on it, and you would view it through an eyepiece. And as it revolved, you would have the impression of moving pictures. And so that's Edison's first idea for motion pictures. But Edison soon changed his ideas about how he ought to do motion pictures. 1889, there was a big uh, international world's fair, the Paris Exposition, and um, Edison visits a number of different scientists living in Paris, including Etienne Marais, who is studying animal motion. And he'd come up with a slightly different way of doing it from Weybridge. He converted a sort of gun into a rapid fire uh, film camera uh, with roll film. And that gave Edison the idea of using roll film uh, instead of these little micro photographs on a cylinder. Upon returning to America, he and his photographer assistant, William Dixon, shown in this clip, began working in a new direction. And they figured out that they could move the film with sprockets. And the film they're developing is about an inch wides of about 35 millimeter film and so they begin to develop what becomes the first sort of modern motion picture uh, technology out of um, that experience of his going to Paris. And in the early 1890s that experience brought forth the invention of the kinetograph, a motion picture camera that employed a rapid intermittent stop-and-go film movement. The projection device for the camera was the kinetoscope peephole viewing cabinet that featured short films shown one at a time. The novelty soon became a rage, with kinetoscope parlors popping up everywhere. In 1893, Edison and Dixon completed the construction of the first motion picture studio, The Black Mariah, located in West Orange, New Jersey. This boxy tar papered building had a huge ceiling with slats that opened up, allowing sunlight to illuminate the scenes. The structure was also built on a turntable, allowing the building to rotate and follow the sun. Over an eight-year period, hundreds of films were produced here. It was a time of great invention for Edison and his assistants, there was even an experiment with a Kinetto phone, which produced the first sound film. Profound as Edison's achievements were, New Jersey was not the only place in the world where film technology was advancing. So motion pictures is one of those inventions that was 
right for the doing at the time. There were lots of people working on the motion picture. Edison happened to get there first commercially, but right behind him were the Lumiere brothers. Louis and Auguste Lumiere brought the world to the world. Having grown up working in their father's Léon France photoplate factory, it was only natural that they would gravitate towards filmmaking. The 1895 creation of their cinematic graph camera revolutionized the young art form's technology. Their design was inspired by the sewing machine, where two pins or claws grip sprocket holes, moving the film along through a gate. Unlike the original Edison kinetograph, which was motorized by electricity, Lumiere's camera was hand cranked. So their contributions are this. They have a camera that's portable. And so the camera goes outside. With the Edison camera, it was stuck in the black and white. Right. Right? So that's really crucial, right? Is going outside. And that's that really helps motion pictures to open up. The Lumieres made the mundane magnificent and can rightfully claim the title of being the fathers of documentary filmmaking. Their first films were a look at workers leaving their father's plant, and another of a train arriving at a station. When people saw projected images, that was awesome to them, because that was a whole new thing. Their camera turns into a projector, and so all of a sudden, Instead of everybody individually looking at pictures, right, through a little peephole, all of a sudden you can project on a screen and have an audience, right, and share in motion pictures. And this, it, this becomes the future. The brothers gave their first public screening in December of 1895, a program of 10 short films, each running approximately 50 seconds. The screening was a big success. It wasn't long before Cinemagraph theaters began opening all over the world. To come and show a film about Niagara Falls, well, who in their wildest dreams would ever get to Niagara Falls or whatever? You know, we're so used to that now. You know, you can go online and look at any country in the world that you want to, but not in 1895. Ironically, the brothers felt that cinema was just a passing novelty, and so declined to sell their camera to other filmmakers. Lumiere's work transformed film into a mass medium, so although their period of production was brief, their legacy is long. Magician George Meliers attended Lumiere's premiere screening, and he was quite impressed. You know, his background is in the theater, right? He's an illusionist, a conjurer, the manager of the theater, Robert Houdin. So he has this background in, in, in magic and illusion, and he sees film as an extension of that, as a way to, to kind of provide a heightened sense of fantasy that would not be possible on the stage. Meliers discovered magic in the motion picture camera. In his hands, special effects became like tricks from a sorcerer's toolbox. His use of multiple exposures, time-lapse photography, dissolves, and hand tinting broadened the scope of cinema. If the Lumieres were the fathers of documentary, the Meliers was the grand wizard of special effects. In the process, he became the first artist to exploit the medium as a means of personal expression. Working in his glass-enclosed studio, Meliers did everything from set and costume design 
to acting in and directing his productions. And so you begin to get story films, right? So late 90s, turn of the century, you begin to get the evolution of story films. The original ones are very short. They're just right. little skits. Right. But increasingly, you begin to get longer and longer films. And Melies in uh, France is the one that's kind of leading the way in a lot of these early uh, storytelling uh, films. Over the course of time, Millier's also expanded the narrative capabilities of film. As his projects became more elaborate, he composed what he called artificially arranged scenes, and these scenes became a story. In this look at segments of Millier's masterpiece, A Trip to the Moon, we can see how his conception of narrative organization was expanding. Millier's flat compositions are very much contained by the boundaries of a theatrical presentation. It would take an American filmmaker to push the cinema toward a more cinematic approach. He becomes the primary filmmaker for Edison, and he's the guy that sort of pushes them more towards story pictures and away from some of the more, um, you know, street scene sort of uh, filming that they'd been doing up to that point. Before becoming a director for the Edison Company, Edwin S. Porter was a projectionist and film exhibitor at the Aden Musée in New York City. His job often involved arranging a series of Edison shorts into a film program. So with, with Porter having this background, we can imagine him looking at all these different shots. 
uh, you know, every week new films come in and, and he's arranging these programs and thinking in terms of the relationship between these shots, you know, arranging them in an order, giving them some sense of order and, 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 uh, and kind of a logic between these different images. <laughs> Porter's Great Train Robbery was a landmark film in the development of telling a story cinematically. Here he's discovered that the art of motion pictures derives from the continuity of shots, not on the shots alone. Porter was well aware of how Méliès built his narrative in A Trip to the Moon based on a series of scenes that happened in time. But in The Great Train Robbery, he's manipulating both time and space. This is achieved through his use of cross-cutting between various scenes occurring at the same time in different places. By showing these parallel stories, he's creating dramatic tension. Porter's film may appear primitive, but for visually unsophisticated audiences in 1903, it was enthusiastically received. The Great Train Robbery became the Bible for all filmmakers until D.W. Griffith came along and further developed Porter's editing principles. <laughs>